Hey there, Michael. You know, camps got underway this week, that's for sure. But ever since that interview with Boomer Wells on the Japan Baseball Weekly podcast, I've been kind of thinking about catchers. What can you tell me about them this week? Catchers, huh? How about foreign catchers? Let's take a look and see what we can find about them in Japanese baseball history. The first foreign catcher to play in Japan was Jun Hirota from Hawaii. He caught for the Yomiuri Giants from 1952 through 1956, winning the Best Nine Award three years running from 1953 to to 1955. Over the five seasons that he played in Japan, Hirota batted 354 with 26 home runs, 144 RBIs, and even stole 18 bases. Furthermore, he caught in 18 Nippon Series games. That was 1952, 53, 55, and 56. Just one game that last year. And was selected as the all-star catcher for the Central League, from 1952 through 1955. If you're interested, Hirota was mentioned extensively in Rob Fitz's autobiography of Wally Yonamine. The two were rivals and teammates from when they were growing up in Hawaii to Kodakuin Stadium in Tokyo. The next full-time foreign catcher to play in Japan was Charlie Lewis, who caught for the Mainichi Orions from 1954 to 1955. Like Hirota before him, Lewis came to Japan from the Hawaii Asahi team. Also like Hirota, Lewis took best nine honors and played for the Pacific All-Stars in the two seasons he was here. Lewis didn't have the same high batting average, only hitting 277, but with 24 home runs and 163 RBIs, he showed a great deal more power. There was also an episode where Lewis took the mound, starting a game, throwing three innings, allowing three runs on three hits, while walking three. He didn't figure in the decision, though. And Lewis also brings up a cautionary tale about what you may find on Wikipedia. While researching this week's report, I found that Wikipedia has Charlie Lewis listed as coming from Missouri. I have reason to believe that this may be a mistake. You see, Lewis hails from a St. Louis high school. That's the name of the high school. While it wouldn't surprise me to find that there is a St. Louis high school in St. Louis, Missouri, I am also aware that there is one in Hawaii. And considering the strong pipe from St. Louis High School in Hawaii to the Hawaii Asahi team, it makes more sense to me that Lewis came out of Hawaii. Furthermore, the Wikipedia article mentions that Lewis is the, quote, only foreign catcher to receive the Best Nine Award, doing it twice. However, we've already learned that Hirota took the Best Nine Award three years in a row as catcher in the Central League. So, I guess it all comes down to what the definition of a gaikokujin is. Is Hirota not counted because he's ethnically Japanese? That's my guess for what's going on. So, while I normally find that the Japanese Wikipedia pages, especially for Japanese baseball, are better maintained than much of Wikipedia in English, there is still just cause to be a little wary. It was a couple decades after these two before another foreign player donned the mask behind the plate. And that player was Adrian Garrett for the Hiroshima Toyo Carp. Garrett caught in 11 games in his first season in Japan, 1977, and then one more game the following season. Adrian just stuck to his regular position, the outfield, for his third and final season of 1979. Garrett 
was selected as an all-star in 1978, but at his regular position, the outfield. And it was another decade plus before we saw another foreigner behind the plate. Mike Diaz caught 15 games for Lotte in 1990 and six more in 1991 as part of his four-year stint in Japan, where he was mainly used as a designated hitter. According to his BaseballReference.com page, Diaz spent most of his career in the North American minor leagues as a catcher. The final two foreign catchers that we have seen here in Japan only caught one game each. Francisco Cabrera was primarily a first baseman in the one season that he played for the Oryx Blue Wave in 1994. Then there was David Nilsson, more commonly known as Dingo, who played just 18 games for the Chunichi Dragons in 2000, moving over to catcher during one of those games. But what was most memorable about Dingo's short career in Japan was that he signed with Chunichi on the condition that he be allowed to play for the Australian team in the Sydney Olympics that summer. Unable to hit Japanese pitching, Dingo was no more by August. And that wraps up my report for foreigners who have played behind the plate here in Japan. But wait, what about the future? It turns out that the Yokohama Bay Stars are giving Kevin Moscatel a tryout throughout the month of February. Yokohama officials do not expect him to make the top team this year. This is really an Ikse tryout. Kevin has bounced around single-A ball for four years, and looking at his limited batting stats on BaseballReference.com, he doesn't look very impressive with the bat. Against the lowest competition in North America, he has thrown out about 33% of potential base runners. And it was mentioned that it is his arm that the base stars are giving as the reason for his tryout. And I have to say, Yokohama has not had somebody who could throw runners out with consistency since Tanishige left. Oh, so long ago. Although, I have to say, Kurobone last season did look very impressive, throwing out almost 40% of potential base runners. Moscatel, I apologize if I'm pronouncing this wrong, has already shown that he can overcome the language barrier by moving from his home in Venezuela to North America. So, this should prove to be a very interesting experiment. Hey, you know, that was interesting. Thanks for the report. And now it's time to pull out the pocket calendar. As my alter ego mentioned at the beginning of this show, Pro Yaku Camps opened in Okinawa last Friday, February 1st. But there still isn't really anything terribly pressing to report. The next Japan Baseball Weekly podcast will be the second Monday of February, the 11th. A bird told me that they've lined up an interview with former Yakult Swallow, Aaron Geil. And speaking of the Swallows, I expected a Tokyo Swallows podcast at the end of January. Guess they just weren't able to get one together on time. So that must mean that they're going to get together and do an extra special preview coming up later this month. More news on that when it's available. And that wraps up this week's Pro Yaku Report. That's it for now. Take care. <laughs>